I'm sure I can get started. I don't know who's in charge of Code Blue, but uh, I think that I could probably begin. Um, I've got a lot of things to show you. I'm very excited to show you. Uh, so welcome. Welcome to uh, my blue box. Um, as I go through this, after we finish it, you can feel free to come up and look inside. Uh, and you can take pictures. Uh, you can take pictures of this as well. So pictures are fine by me. So uh, thank you so much uh, for your interest and for coming. Um, my name is Mike Spicer. Um, I'm also known as Dark Matter on the internet. So, um, I'm, uh, I'm really passionate about wireless. I think of myself as a mad scientist. Um, and also I think of myself as uh, a hacker and creator. Um, these pictures that you see on the screen right here, uh, one of them was from my talk. Uh, I did a talk at DEF CON this year on the main stage there. Um, and then the one on the right hand side is the picture of this, my new project, the Wi-Fi Kraken, which is uh, the first, this is uh, the second time that I've presented this project. So this is the new uh, system that I'm very excited to show you. Also, if anyone has questions or things uh, throughout the presentation, I want this to be interactive. So feel free to raise your hand and ask questions. So this all started with uh, me being curious. I started off being curious and wanted to know what's going on on the Wi-Fi. And the box on the left was my very first project. It was essentially a Raspberry Pi with two wireless radios. Uh, and you can see those the wireless radios. One is here and one is here with some batteries. And I put that in my backpack started carrying it around with me um, and then I was able to uh, collect some data but I learned a lot of lessons from doing that um, and I didn't catch very much data I was missing a lot of information um, and the reason is is because I was using the wrong software so it's very much a lesson to me to uh, use the correct software and hardware together so that project turned out to be a little bit bigger. So if you look on this other side, I then built, with the help of my friends, all of these boxes. So it was a, a big improvement over the previous one box in my backpack. And we ended up placing those around a conference, uh, DEF CON in Las Vegas, uh, and also Black Hat in Las Vegas, and deployed those sensors throughout the conference and gathered data uh, there. This was a very big learning experience um, because, uh, first of all, they were little suitcases and security was very concerned that they could be uh, some sort of uh, harmful devices, maybe bombs. <laughs> so uh, it was, it was uh, interesting. Only one, though, got confiscated. Um, and I ultimately got it back after I explained what the project was. <laughs> um, but uh, it's interesting when you're putting things around places, people start to notice them and want to know what's going on with your boxes. Uh, so I have been around the world. Uh, this is my first time to Japan. I'm very excited. This has definitely been on my, uh, my bucket list, my lifelong goal list to come to Japan. So thank you so much for having me. It's, it's absolutely been a pleasure. I love it here. Um, but as you can see, I've been uh, with the, the Wi-Fi Cactus, my first project, to all of these locations. Um, and there's still more I want to go to. So, uh, and I'm very happy to add Code Blue here on this. Uh, this has been uh, an absolute treat. So thank you so much. Um, uh, you might have seen uh, me with Darren Kitchen on the episode of Hack 5, if you're familiar with that YouTube channel. Um, Darren and me are uh, really good friends, and he actually uh, provided me the, the, the main devices, the Hack 5 Pineapple Tetras, that make up each of the, um, each of the uh, devices that are being used in the Wi-Fi Cactus. There's 25 of those in the Cactus. Uh, and so it was um, through a sponsorship through Hack 5, so I'm very appreciative to them. And I've been on the show a number of times and, and done interviews. Um, Last year, I had the opportunity to go to DEF CON China uh, for the first time for its beta rollout. And that was very interesting, <laughs> bringing this to China. <laughs> um, 
So yeah, it's uh, very interesting <laughs> bringing that to China. But I made it and everything is okay. Um, <laughs> now I'm here to talk to you guys. So I learned a lot of lessons. I learned a lot of things um, from building these different projects and building these things up. And the things that I learned is that I need to get more throughput. So one of the disadvantages of the Wi-Fi cactus, let me just give you a quick introduction on the Wi-Fi cactus. Uh, it's made up of the 25 pineapple tetras, the Hack5 pineapple tetras. It then takes all that data and it takes it over ethernet and brings it back to the Intel Nook at the top. So this is an i5 Intel Nook, uh, uh, 8th gen Intel uh, chip. And then it also has an NVMe storage device, so for, hall, for hard drive. So that's all coming back through Ethernet. And these are gigabit switches, two gigabit switches. And I chose these switches uh, because they support DC input, DC power. So the data is coming from all these aggregated through the switches to the Nook. So that means that I have a single one gigabit bottleneck on this system. And I wanted more because if you look at the capability, each of these devices has two wireless radios. Uh, and essentially each of those wireless radios uh, is capable of doing up to um, uh, 600 megabits a piece. So two radios can, can saturate the gigabit, depending on how busy the environment is. And so as I'm aggregating the data back, I'm going to inevitably have lost with this. Um, oh, another thing too is uh, there's this cool board right here. This board, uh, it's an antenna aggregator, uh, or a signal aggregator. So it's taking the input from two signals, two antennas, and it's putting it out into eight radios. And so it reduces the overall number of antennas. This originally had a hundred antennas, and now it's down to 86. So <laughs> we're, we're making progress. Um, let's see, the other thing that I've upgraded on this, in the first iterations of it, I was using a lead acid car battery, uh, which weighed about um, uh, eight to 10 kilos, right? Is that right? No, yeah, eight to 10 kilos for a, a, a total weight of about 30 kilos. And so now I've changed those to lithium ion and now that's um, approximately about 15 kilos now. So it's a lot less weight and <laughs> makes my back less sore. <laughs> and I can carry it around longer. Also, the duration is up. It only lasted about 30 minutes with the lead acid battery. With the lithium ions, it's about three hours of runtime that I could walk around, I could go places. So. Um, yeah, I'm actually uh, gonna see about maybe walking around the streets of Tokyo. Do you guys think that that's a good idea? <laughs> the consensus is yes. <laughs> Thank you. Um, uh, also, one other thing at the bottom of it is I do have an AC power supply because sometimes when I'm doing presentations or demonstrations or have it sitting someplace for a long time, it's nice to have it plugged in so that that way I'm not just using the batteries. Um, oh, and then I do have uh, an Arduino here. The Arduino is powering the lights. These are NeoPixel lights uh, from Adafruit. So you always have to add lights to your project so that that way uh, it looks pretty. <laughs> it's important to have pretty. And then the pineapple on top is homage to the, the Hack5 pineapple tetras that this device is made up of. Um, so. Yes, and now, uh, thanks to my friend Kentaro, uh, who is one of the hardworking organizers of this event, there is now a duck on here as well, so. <laughs> Thank you, Kentaro, for the duck. Duck army. Okay, uh, so that is the Wi-Fi cactus. Um, and then the lesson learned from the Wi-Fi cactus was the throughput and bandwidth issues. So um, after this is over, feel free to come up and you can take a look. But essentially what I've done is I've taken, I've got less radios. So this is 50 radios. This one only has 14 radios. So it's a bit less radios. But they're, each of the radios is going to a unique, uh, to two different unique USB 3.0 root hubs. And I'm doing that by having two USB to PCI Express uh, uh, seven port USB hubs. So I'm able to get more throughput from the adapters directly to the solid state hard drive. Um, and it, which, which completely bypasses the ethernet issue that I was having here. 
Um, the other thing too is this device, the, the Hack 5 Pineapple Tetra is a fantastic device. Uh, however, uh, it, it uses only the 802.11n uh, wireless radios. Um, and more recently, we're already on Wi-Fi 6, which is 802.11ax, and I'm not there yet. So my next project will be an 802.11ax project. This project is 802.11ac uh, capable. So the chipsets in this, the wireless adapters, are called MediaTek MT7612, and they have built-in Linux kernel support beyond kernel version 4.30. Now the advantage of that is you're going to be spending a lot more time capturing data, as you can see from the screen, as opposed to uh, fighting with drivers and trying to make changes and compile. Uh, I've ran into a lot of issues with drivers, um, and so it's very nice to have these working. So if you want to do wireless monitoring, uh, this is definitely the best place to start right now, um, is the, the uh, MediaTek MT7612. Um, I really love those. So um, the pictures that you see in the middle there, uh, th this is the logo of the, the Kraken. Um, on the left in the middle picture was the first time I had taken this. The other advantage of this is I close the lid, I lock the hand, the lock the locks, and then I check it at luggage. <laughs> and then it ships with me and it's easy. This takes about an hour and a half to disassemble everything and put it into two separate cases because by itself it weighs too much to, to travel with. Um, so it's a little, this one is a lot easier to travel with. Also, it too is battery powered. Uh, there are these batteries called talent cell batteries. Yeah, I'll just have to come up and look at them. Essentially, it gives this device about three and a half to four hours of runtime on those batteries. And they're also uh, rated at just under 100 watt hours, so you can bring them on a plane. So, and I have three of those, uh, and I brought them here with me um, on my flight from the United States. Um, okay, also, the picture on the right that you see there is uh, at Black Hat in Las Vegas. Uh, I was able to set this device up and was able to monitor uh, the, the traffic for a number of hours and days there. So they've always been so uh, uh, great to me and allowed me to set up my projects to be able to do analysis there. Um, and so it gives me a lot of opportunity to get data. And if you can see um, the, the monkey right there next to him, Lyle, he's, uh, he's, the, he's the network operations center monkey. Um, and so he's, he's always there and, and interested in my projects. Uh, I'm going to do um, some live demos. We're going to get into some live data of what's going on in the environment around us. But first, I wanted to show you some of the data that I've captured uh, in the past. So being able to go around the world and travel to different conferences, it enables me to do graphs like this. And what this graph shows is uh, each of the small dots is a unique MAC address. And so this could be of, of your cell phone, this could be of laptops, this could be of different devices that I see in the environment. And I'm taking that MAC address and I'm correlating it to the different locations where I've seen them. So for example, uh, you can see Black Hat in 2017 to Black Hat 2018. You can see the lines in the layover where there's, there's the correlation and there's the Oh yeah, I've got a mouse pointer. You can see the group here, the grouping. So these, these are people who have gone to both of those. And so I'm essentially filtering by edge nodes greater than two. And then also we can see that there's a lot of people who came from Black Hat to DEF CON 2017. And we can also see this one's an interesting, DEF CON 2018 or DEF CON 26 um, and DEF CON 25. So there's a big clustering of people who went back the next year. So it's interesting to be able to see this. And of course, you see this huge following from Black Hat uh, 17 to DEF CON 25 because it's at the end of the week. So I, I anticipate here, I'll see some people at Code Blue that hopefully I'll see also at Tokyo, AV Tokyo. So uh, we'll see something similar on this type of graph for next year. <laughs> Um, and, and so it's really neat to see this, and it really gives us a sense that our community is global. We, like, I see very similar people at, at all of the different places. It's really neat to see the community and the globalness, and to see kind of the mapping um, of how this all comes together. Um, 
Another interesting thing is the data leaks. Uh, that's one of the most fascinating things to me. Um, we look at we look at our um, uh, we look at apps and we look at our, our websites and things. And luckily, our websites have the little lock, right, that tell us that there's SSL happening and that things are, or TSL that's happening um, or TLS that's happening, and that we have some level of encryption, right? Um, but apps, there's no way to see that. There's no information that says this communication is happening encrypted. And here's an example uh, from the DEF CON 26 uh, data set that I had, where a ZTE phone, and it was a desktop weather widget, which had access to the phone's geolocation, was doing an API call over HTTP with no encryption. So. Um, and if you can see, oh yeah, I've got this. I keep wanting to go over here. I keep wanting to van a white. Um, if you if you can see the uh, the latitude and longitude there, that's a part of this. So I've essentially gotten this device's MAC address, and I've got their latitude and longitude as soon as they make the post request to the API. So what could go wrong with that? Essentially, it's a people tracker at that point. So anytime that person is uh, looking for their weather, and it, this could be something benign as I want to know if it's going to be rainy tonight. Um, it's it's leaking my information, um, and in most cases on phones, that's privileged information. You have to specifically say, um, I give permission to my location data, right? Because location data is privileged information on most devices now. Also, uh, when I checked this data, uh, that that. Uh, API call is still valid, so you could type that in on your phone right now um, and get the get the uh, weather for that location, and it's still using HTTP. Um, so I'm still I'm concerned that you know people are still doing things unencrypted. So yay for information leaks. Um, I, here's some of my contact info. I just want to give that to you guys right now. Um, we still have some bit more time. I'm going to go into the actual software and go to the live demo portion of this. But yeah, feel free to take a picture of this. And then in a moment, I'll bring this back up. Um, I also wrote a tool called PCAPinator uh, on my GitHub. And basically, it's a tool to uh, basically uh, parallelize uh, PCAP analysis. So it tears a PCAP into multiple pieces or breaks it into multiple smaller pieces. And then um, uh, it, it uh, will then process those based on how many cores you have on your system. Um, and then, uh, then we'll reassemble the results at the end. Um, and so that's it's a very useful tool for uh, when you're dealing with large amounts of data. Like my data collection from all the different locations has been way over a terabyte at this point. So lots of data. Okay, let's take a look at actually the software. So first off, I just wanted to do a shout out. This Okay, so we've got two different services running. So we've got the Wi-Fi Kraken. So this screen we're looking at right now is the Wi-Fi Kraken. It's this one. And then we've got the Wi-Fi Cactus and I'll show you that one in a moment. So this one, this screen that you see on right now, is a mobile dashboard developed by um, your own uh, El Quintaro. He built this, and it's on his GitHub. Uh, the software that I'm using is a software called Kismet. Have any of you heard of Kismet? A couple of you. So Kismet is turning into a wireless analysis software, uh, oh, completely open source, free to use. You can install it on your laptop, and uh, this is what you end up getting. Uh, you are able to then see what's going on in the environment. The red, don't be worried, the red isn't anything to be concerned of. It just means that we have captured the WPA handshake. Uh, and I've been able to monitor and watch the communication enough to be able to get the WPA handshakes on each of these access points. So that's cool. Uh, back to the dashboard. Um, Kentaro made this dashboard, uh, which is super handy and provides summary information for what's going on in the wireless around us. So right now, this device is seeing 89 active channels. Um, I do have 13 out of 13. This actually does 14 devices. I've only got 13. One of them's being a little finicky. Uh, that's one of the problems of using USB wireless devices, and so many of them, you get a little bit of... Uh, you get a little bit of issue, uh, and so 13 are active and working right now. The 14th is not, but we're seeing data on 89 channels currently. We're recording data at about um, three kilobytes per second, uh, or three kilopackets per second, 
And then also, I've seen so far 24,000 unique devices uh, in the environment, which is a lot, a lot of devices. And so we're probably seeing also devices of people driving by. We're probably seeing people up above us, below us, <laughs> you know, people all around us. We're probably seeing a lot of uh, additional communication because wireless is magical and it just goes everywhere. It's all around us. It doesn't stop at walls, right? It's some walls it does if they're concrete and lead lined. But <laughs> for the most part, it, it, we're able to see wireless uh, all around us. And this can pick up basically for around 100 meters um, is what it's capable of seeing. Uh, we can also see which channels uh, seem to have the most devices on them. So we can see here, uh, it looks like uh, 5.18 gigahertz has, you know, 73. And we can also see as people are moving around the building, it's going to change because of what access point they are on. Also, if you're using something like Aruba or something that has like the Cisco Aeronets that have cloud controller, it's actually going to um, strategize your wireless access point channels. Um, throughout the, the environment as the environment changes to try to offload load to make sure the areas are getting the best throughput that they can. And so it's really nice to be able to have this many radios so that you can watch those types of things happen. You can see what's going on in the environment, watch those transitions happen, um, and be able to capture that communication. Um, let's see, it uh, looks like currently we have uh, 485 unique access points in the environment. Um, like I said, we've got 22,000 clients on those access points or that are uh, client devices. Um, and then uh, we've got, what are these ones? So here's, let's see. It's, it's so many, it might take a moment to load. We'll leave that, we'll, we'll, uh, let's see if I can open a new one. Yeah, there we go. Okay, so, and we can start seeing all of the individual devices that are listed in here. We can immediately click on a device. I don't know whose device this is, but we can get uh, some base information about this device, who the manufacturer is. Uh, this is based off of MAC address. This one is currently unknown. Um, and we can see just some base information, so it's really nice. Kismet, um, so this, is, this information is pulling from Kismet using the APIs. Uh, oh, interesting. <laughs> Server crash. Wait. No, it's still running. What in the world? Okay. There we go. Okay, it just needs to reload the page. Um, so this is the full UI. So that dashboard I was showing you was just a plugin that Kentaro had made. This is the full UI, uh, the full user interface for uh, Kismet. And basically, the creator of Kismet has done a really good job of allowing us to quickly access very important information about our network. Whether you're a, um, a blue team or if you're doing red team activities. So a red team type of activity would be trying to capture the, 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 the handshake or trying to understand what clients there are and try to enumerate or get information about uh, who's in the environment, and then figuring out a way to manipulate them into connecting to your own network, man in the middle of them, or maybe denial of service, so then they'll connect to something else. You'll want to do those types of behaviors as a red teamer. And this tool allows us to quickly figure out that type of information. So let's click on an access point. This, this one for code blue currently has 693 connected devices. That's a lot of devices on one access point. We can see that the majority of the communication is happening on 526 and a little bleed over onto 528, uh, which it's probably, um, it might be a 20 or 40 megahertz channel width. I'm not sure, I'd have to look at the packets. But we can see the majority of the communication is data packets. Uh, and so based on that, we know that people are using that and getting a lot of communication, streaming stuff, uh, probably pulling up things on their phone. Um, and then there's the LLC or management frames, which are telling how the communication works. And that's a much smaller portion. So if someone is doing um, uh, bad things, if somebody's trying to hack this or do something, we might see these LLC frames much, much higher uh, because 
that would be someone trying to do like a de-authentication attack or man in the middle attack or trying to do something to you to try to convince you to connect to their stuff or to get you to disconnect and that all happens at the management level so we would see a significant portion of uh, the management frames but this just looks like people are using the Wi-Fi <laughs> so use on and then here, if we look at the 802.11, we can see that it's, uh, the SSID has been beaconed out as this. This is the, the BSSID, which is the MAC address of the a broadcasting radio. Um, we can see that it's beaconed a ton of times. <laughs> so uh, we, we know that that's happening. Um, we can look at the different types of packets. We can see if there's been data or if we've got fragmentation, or if we have retry. So that could be something that blue teamers use or just your IT staff use to be able to do analysis on your wireless infrastructure. Perhaps your wireless infrastructure is struggling, you're having slow bandwidth, you're having issues. You can see all of that with an external tool now uh, and be able to determine that and be able to track down those issues. Maybe it's a specific client that keeps having a lot of retries. Uh, we'd be able to track that down. Uh, like I said before, one of the most handy things is to be able to do the uh, WPA, uh, be able to capture the WPA handshake. And since it's highlighted in red, that means it's already accessible. And since it's accessible, I can just one click it, download it, and pull it open in Wireshark just that quick. And this is the EAPOL uh, of the handshake that took there, uh, that I captured. And so from here, it's now one step to be able to take this and put it into Hashcat to be able to be in, begin cracking it. So if I was doing a pen test on this infrastructure, that quick for me to get this access point um, and try to get the password. So that's why I always recommend uh, if you do use WPA personal uh, with a passphrase, make sure that it is at least 12 to 15 characters, to, uh, 12 or longer characters, so that that way uh, you're able to um, avoid someone like me that's going to crack your network. <laughs> Uh, also, we can see channel utilization, so we can see how much wireless is uh, based on the QBSS, uh, see how much uh, the clients are communicating at a single time, and as you can see, it is doing HT40 mode, so that means it's 40 megahertz channel width on this channel. Um, we can also see what the beacon rate is. We can it's like just lots of really cool stuff we can see. We can also see what the country code is set to. Obviously, we're in Japan, but that's useful um, for let's say we're um, in the United States and someone has their country code set to Japan and there's specific channels that are illegal to broadcast on. I could then detect that just using the software here. Uh, and then in addition to this, uh, we can also see shared hardware. So this means that these are uh, access points or uh, uh, devices that are likely connected because they're doing similar types of behavior. So for example, uh, they're doing virtual access points, uh, as far as I can tell, uh, with the Code Blue Private, Code, code Blue, the Free Wi-Fi, and the Koroke. I don't know how you say that, <laughs> um, but uh, essentially uh, they're all seemingly coming from very similar MAC addresses, the 0040CB43, uh, and I believe that's a Ruba MAC address. Uh, if we go and look at uh, the view, the AP details, uh, it's saying Hewlett Packard, but I do believe HP bought Aruba or something like that, or somehow it's in the, in the OUI for that. So um, we can now look, like I just took one hop over and we can look at this device, see what it's beaconing, see what's happening, and then see what the analysis is on this access point. So it's very handy, very useful uh, for breaking down and doing the analysis. Um, we can further then look at uh, the different clients. So we have Wi-Fi behavior, uh, which is when you have a client using multiple networks over time. And it's also nice, there's all these little help buttons, so if you don't know what something is, you can just click on it too. And we can also see the associated clients. So these clients are like clients that are roaming, and these clients are like our phones, laptops, and all sorts of devices that are connected. So let's say uh, that this device is um, causing problems. We can immediately click View Client Details. We can add a note that's a uh, potential issue. And then we can save that note, and we can now f like keep track of who this is and what they're doing. And we can see then, if we look at the 802.11 graph here, 
let's see what uh, it's done client behavior to the, all of these access points. Okay, so what are these access points? Uh, we didn't capture which one that one was. We're not sure which one that one was. Uh, and see, there's, see how it's zero bytes? I just saw them beaconing or communicating, but I didn't actually see any data communicated throughout them. So this one's actually kind of a bad example. Let's see, let me pick another one at random. 28, that one looks good. Intel, Intel. Let's see, what is this one up to? Ah, here we go. So this one probed for code blue, uh, and it also probed to broadcast. Uh, so this one, based on probing to broadcast, uh, it might be susceptible to a um, karma attack or a, a, a basically a man in the middle attack where I could set up an access point because it basically is broadcasting and probing and saying, hey, is any network available that I want to connect to? Um, and so that might be a device that we could manipulate if you were trying to do man in the middle attack on that. Um, okay, let's back out of this just a little bit. Um, and so I'm going to show you, we already saw the devices, the data sources, so we can see that the 13 devices and which devices are pushing the most traffic. So one of the things I've done is, based on the environment, I looked at the number of clients that we have, and I looked at the channels, so channel 52, 132, 60, these ones are pretty heavily used channels, so I decided to fix some of the channels. So some of the radios are bouncing between channels, or channel hopping is what it's referred to as. And then I've fixed some of these others. You can see this one here is fixed, and this one here is fixed. So basically what that means is I'm going to be listening on those channels constantly so that that way I get the most amount of information. Um, and, and so the, uh, the advantage of that is that I can get more communication uh, because it's not switching channels. Because every time you switch channels, you're going to miss out on some of the communication. So that's one of the new things that I'm working on. I'm actually, last night, uh, with Kintara's help, started building a script where I want to do this automatically. Um, where I'm able to do the auto-identifying of a network, identify the highest used channels, and then have it switch maybe three or four radios onto the top highest channels so I can get the most amount of data captured for my analysis. Because that's always been an issue, and I'll show you the reason why, this is the Wi-Fi cactus now. Uh, we'll look at the same graph, the channel hopping. So it's a much bigger swath of connection that's happening uh, because currently there's 48 radios that are active. Uh, two of them are not up for some reason. I'm not sure what's going on. Looks like maybe the top one is kind of sleepy. Um, <laughs> but uh, uh, So basically there's 48 radios currently out of the 50 that are currently uh, capturing things. The goal with the cactus was to not have any radios um, uh, to excuse me, to have as much wireless spectrum coverage as possible. And as you can see, if we compare this channel hopping graph to this one, <laughs> it's quite a difference. <laughs> Let me zoom it. There we go. So, um, yeah, so the, the cactus solves that problem. But like I said before, it's the problem is with the cactus is the bandwidth limitations, the throughput limitations of the Ethernet ports. So, all right, let's see, how are we on time? I think I've got 20 more minutes, is that right? 12.30 something, okay. Um, all right, so on the Wi-Fi cactus, uh, so essentially we've got the same type of interface here, but I'm basically capturing data at a much higher rate uh, because of all of the radios that are in here. Um, and so, let's see. The other thing too I wanted to show you as well, down here in the messages, um, we'll see if anything pops up. Uh, Kismet also has built into it uh, something called a, uh, Intrusion Detection System, or IDS. And there are certain signatures uh, that um, it's built to, to identify. Some of those signatures are if someone does a man-in-the-middle attack uh, or if they do a de-authentication attack. Um, 
let's see, what are some of the other ones? Uh, if someone were to launch a crax attack, uh, crax, the key inst reinstallation attack, it will do identification for that. Uh, Broadpone, uh, the Broadpone vulnerability, wireless vulnerability, it does have support to identify that. Um, uh, it also looks for other weird things, weird cases too, such as if someone uses an SSID that is longer than 32 bytes, uh, it, it, that's, that's something that it could show uh, malformed behavior or it could do some damage because that's longer than the spec. Um, and so that's, some way, that's a way that uh, it, it can be identified and to see if someone's trying to do something tricky. Maybe they're trying to do an injection based off of SSID. Uh, yeah, so for example, right there, we just got a nonce, uh, it went by too quick. There's too many devices. Uh, I'll have to go back and look in the logs. Uh, basically, that was a, I believe it was a nonce recycle. So that could have been legitimate behavior of the um, a wireless access point uh, renewing its encryption. Um, or it could have been somebody doing it on purpose. The fact that we're not seeing a ton of them, that's the thing about wireless attacks, they're usually very noisy. Uh, they're usually doing a lot of things at once. The fact that we only see it once is probably uh, benign behavior. It's probably something built into the access point. Yeah, WPA, EAPOL, RSN, reuse. Yeah, so that's probably just something that's happening with the access point that's throwing out that warning. But if someone had a Ponagachi, has anyone heard of the Ponagachis? couple hands. I think, do you have one, sir? Not yet. Um, uh, Ponagachi, essentially what it is is, uh, have you heard of Tamagotchis? Of course you have. It's Japan, right? Um, uh, it's it's, it's uh, this cute little device that was created uh, to do deauthentication attacks uh, as you walk around. It uses a Raspberry Pi and uh, ink print screen, um, and it's got a cute little face and all it does is deauthenticate a wireless network and then capture the handshake. So, <laughs> yeah. oh, silly people. Um, and so if someone were to bring one of those in here and launch that, our Wi-Fi might stop working, but I would be able to see that that attack took place. So I'd be able to see it, a Ponagachi uh, take place uh, in this environment. Um, Okay, I definitely want to leave time for questions and for you guys to come up and look at things and, and stuff like that. So I'm going to go ahead and end the formal portion of the, this um, uh, presentation and then we'll, we'll allow the questions and you guys can come up and look. And um, uh, I do have some stickers. I don't have enough for everyone. I apologize. Um, but I will hand out as many as I can. And if you're coming to AV Tokyo, I'll have some more there. So uh, thank you so much for your time. I appreciate it. Thank you. Okay, questions. Yes. One of the first uh, screens you were showing for your data collection, I believe you said the plugin. Uh, I noticed when you scrolled down, you had a section for Bluetooth. Ah. Are there any plans to support Bluetooth or cellular? Uh, I would love cellular. It's already built in. Um, I just don't have the modules activated. I, I don't have a, a card for this, a Bluetooth card. Uh, you just need a UD100 or just a, a dumb Bluetooth device. Uh, to be able to capture it. It's basically looking for Bluetooth and Blee beacons. Um, on the Cactus, I did have it hooked up. I don't have it currently. The Nook actually has Bluetooth built in, uh, but I don't have this dashboard on that on the Cactus. But that's built into Kismet. In addition to that, um, you can do RTL 433. So if you hook up an SDR to Kismet, it will start gathering 433. Um, and decode those packets uh, for different IoT devices that are on 433 megahertz. In addition, uh, ADSB was just added too. Um, I don't have an ADSB adapter, but ADSB is the signal that airplanes send out to be able to tell their geolocation, their uh, altitude, uh, latitude, longitude, all of that good stuff, and then it will map it inside of here. So Kismet really is turning into a full wireless analysis software. So through RTL SDR, ADSB, um, Bluetooth, Wi-Fi, uh, basically the whole spectrum. Um, I, the, the, the cellular is a little bit more difficult to do monitoring on because you need an active connection to be able to do monitoring has been my experience. So that's an area of interest I definitely am working towards um, because I get that question a lot and I, I, I want to know what's going on in the cell. So, but I'm not there yet. So hopefully in the future uh, I could have some research in the, the 4G, 5G arena. It's my goal. So thank you. Other questions? 
uh, how much uh, does it cost, cost, uh, does it cost to, to build uh, Wi-Fi Kraken and Wi-Fi uh, Cactus? Okay. Uh, the question is, how much does it cost to create the Kraken and the Cactus? The Cactus was a little bit more expensive, but luckily it was a sponsorship. Uh, but the retail cost on that would be about six thousand dollars US. US. Uh, what is that? Six hundred. Six hundred thousand yen. Is that right? I don't know. I can't remember what the conversion rate is. Something like that. And then uh, this one um, is a lot cheaper. Uh, the motherboard is actually an old fourth gen um, Intel processor, so that's probably like $50 on eBay. The wireless adapters are about $25 each, so I would say maybe four to five hundred dollars to build this, and then and then the case was about hundred and fifty dollars for this hardened. Uh, it's not even a Pelican case; it's a rip-off case called Condition One, but it works pretty well. Uh, so it's a bit cheaper. Uh, the batteries are forty-five dollars a piece as well uh, for the batteries. So I would say five to six hundred dollars to build something like this. Um, and if you want to get started, you could take a laptop one of these adapters and run Linux, um, Pen2 Linux or Ubuntu, the latest version of Ubuntu, uh, plug the adapter in, install Kismet, and you could get started and do the similar things that I'm doing here. So it's that, it's that easy for you to start doing analysis on the Wi-Fi. Thank you. Thank you for your question. Any other questions? Other questions? Feel free to come up here, and if you think of anything else, um, just shout it out at me. Thank you so much.